There is a lot of debate on it. Some politicians in the OEC uh, region argue that, in fact, it has failed. Uh, and sometimes uh, reactions are even much more negative uh, because we, and it has become even a kind of bad word among Islamophobic discourse uh, uh, when they started accusing people uh, uh, like Timmies or multiculturalists. Uh, it's a kind of uh, bad terminology that they, they, they use to attack people who, who promote uh, tolerance. Uh, and I just, uh, this just reminds me uh, the, the state, some of the statements of Breivik uh, 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 why, explaining why he attacked uh, uh, the summer camp of uh, summer camp of the youth of uh, Labour uh, Party in Sweden. He, 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 he said that uh, in fact he, he, he fed up with the multiculturalism of this uh, party because it was uh, allowing uh, uh, a lot of uh, migrants uh, entering the to the country, uh, and uh, and it was a kind of tool uh, for the Islamization of uh, of the country. Uh, so I think this discussion will be uh, very interesting also to see what actually uh, multiculturalism means uh, from Canadian point of view. Our speaker is uh, uh, Amira. Erga, Erga Wabi, I hope I pronounced correct. Uh, uh, she is uh, the human rights officer uh, for the Canadian Council on American Islamic Relations, which is based uh, in Ottawa. She is also a freelance uh, uh, journalist who has spent time uh, researching the experiences of diverse communities and reporting on barriers to integration for the Canadian Broadcasting uh, Corporation. She regularly contributes to both uh, mainstream and alternative media writing on a number of topics ranging from human rights to educational uh, policy. Additionally, uh, Ms. Adahabi uh, taught media literacy and other general subjects at a private Islamic school in Ottawa. And uh, a very brief information on the Council of, uh, on American Islamic Relations. It is a, an NGO, uh, grassroots NGO based in uh, Ottawa, Canada. Its mandate is to, uh, to deal, uh, to to be a lead, uh, leading voice that in, enriches Canadian society through Muslim civic engagement and promotion of human rights. It does this through activism in the areas of media relations, anti-discrimination, and policy advocacy of the cases that uh, perhaps most firmly help establish Care Can as a credible and mainstream voice on behalf of Canadian Muslims was that of Mahir Arar. Uh, Arar's case of illegal rendition to torture represents a microcosm of uh, all the negative consequences of human rights and civil liberties creation uh, uh, during the post-9-11 uh, period. Maybe she's going to also give more details about this case uh, in her uh, speech. Now, this the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very, very much. So I'd like to, uh, first of all, start off uh, by thanking uh, Mr. Taskin uh, Soikan uh, for inviting uh, CARE Canada to participate um, in this forum. Um, we, this is actually the person that I really got uh, to understand what the uh, work that's being done with the OSCE and the ODIHR, the kind of work they're doing, and I think it's it's really a great initiative um, is happening here. Um, and as we go and discuss multiculturalism in Canada, I think it will be clear to see that um, a lot of the same values that are uh, sort of um, educating and, and giving us ideas in Canada are very much similar to the ideals that the OSC is trying to um, strive for as well. So there's a lot of congruence in our discussion, I think, um, and it's something that, um, as a Canadian, I'm, I'm very pleased to participate in um, and uh, contribute to. I'd also like to thank um, the AV staff, Tom. He's in the back. He's helping me. He helped me technically. And uh, that's really important because um, it's, 
study, so my husband at home who deals with the computer. So I, I just wanted to say thank you to him. Um, and I also want to say thank you to all of you. I know it's a long plenary session next door. It's pretty intense, so to take the time to sit again um, is a real uh, effort on your behalf. And so I just want to say thank you. I apologize that I'll be talking quite a bit. Um, nevertheless, I will definitely be opening it um, for you all to participate in and to hear your um, views, opinion, feedback, um, and you know, see how this comes across uh, to you. It will be very interesting. So yes, I'm from Canada. Um, that's my hometown. That's where I grew up in Ottawa. I hope uh, if you're ever in the city to please come and, and visit us there. Um, and I am from the Canadian Council on American Islamic Relations, and as uh, Tank had mentioned, uh, we deal with civic engagement, trying to promote um, the, uh, the ability of Canadian Muslims to get engaged, to get involved, and ensure as well that they understand their rights as citizens and the responsibilities of citizens. So that's sort of our aim. Okay, so today, um, got a lot to get through. Um, I'll try to make it as fun and dynamic as I can, um, but really I definitely want to hear from you. So I, I'll go through it all and try to sort of set out um, the table and see what we can uh, take away from this. Um, first I'll go over the Muslim demographics in Canada and Europe, because that's um, what's most of interest to you. Um, we'll look a little bit about on religious intolerance and some recent figures that have come out um, about religious intolerance around the world. Um, then, sort of the crux of the presentation today is the history and evolution of multiculturalism in Canada, and then we'll get into case law. So I don't know how many lawyers are here. Um, I uh, studied law as well as journalism, so I have some background in it. But what's really interesting in, in case law in Canada is a lot of the values of multiculturalism are continually coming up as issues the Supreme Court of Canada is facing, and so that they are actually playing a role in helping the understanding of, you know, yes, multiculturalism is a lovely word for some people, it might be negative for others, but how does it actually come down on the ground when you have uh, competing rights, people who have equally uh, credible rights, um, but how do you actually wind up negotiating those rights? Then we'll go to conclusions and questions. So that's sort of a brief outline of what we'll do today. Okay, so demographics, numbers. In terms of uh, Islam in Canada, um, there has been incredible growth there. Um, if we look at, uh, you know, going back to uh, 1991, uh, so there was about 250,000 Muslims living in Canada. Um, just 10 years later, there was uh, over half a million Muslims living in Canada, which is a rate of about 129% uh, growth rate. Um, so there is definite, uh, definitely a lot of growth there. Most recent figures show that um, Canadian Muslims are currently almost at 1 million, and so they're making up 2.8% uh, of the population. It's expected that by 2030, that number is going to triple to 2.7 million, or 6.6% of the population. What's interesting to note is um, in 10 out of 25 metropolitan areas, um, uh, Canadian Muslims make up the largest non-Christian community uh, there, so in 10 out of 25 metropolitan areas, so they are a significant number. Um, and about 60% of them live in my province of Ontario. So um, Ontarians uh, typically attracted a lot of immigrants, there's a lot of um, jobs in various sectors, and so um, while Alberta now is starting to attract more immigrants, um, Ontario has traditionally been a, a top destination. The other provinces that have high numbers of Muslims include Quebec, um, as well as the western provinces. Um, there are about over 200 mosques or so in Canada, um, as well as many um, informal prayer spaces that people will use. Um, the presence of Muslims in Canada, just to give you some background, and that we can sort of compare it to the situation of Muslims and other minorities in, in Europe, um, is that the, the, it shows historically that we've been, the Muslims have been there since the mid-19th century, and the very first mosque in all of North America was actually um, built in Edmonton, um, in Alberta, in 1938. The first Muslims that arrived in Canada were settlers and adventurers, and there has been an increasing tide of immigration um, thereafter, um, and the rate of immigration in Canada is roughly double that of the US, so huge rates of immigration. 
Um, Canadian Muslims are actually highly uh, educated according to polling um, that was done um, in 2006, where it showed that 45% um, hold a university degree. Um, and for the uh, Canadian population, that's a, uh, the general Canadian population, that's a 33%. So there's a high rate of um, higher education there. And as in other parts of the world, Canada's Muslim communities are predominantly younger. So the reported median age is uh, 36.8 years of age, uh, compared to 45.9 for the rest of the population. Um, so they come from all over the world, just, just like in Europe. Uh, they represent over 44 different ethnicities. Um, you'll find them uh, active in politics. We have members of parliament who are Muslim. Uh, you'll have, um, a, we have a Canadian senator who is of, uh, also of Muslim faith. Um, and then within that, there's many different um, groups within sort of the overall Muslim group. There's Sunni, the Shia, Ahmadi, Ismaili. So there's a lot of... Uh, uh, again, it's very similar, I would say, to other uh, Muslim communities where there's a real diversity there. Okay, looking at Europe, um, just to sort of get a sense of, of when we're talking about Muslim communities, um, the uh, Pew Forum... Oh. So the Pew Forum uh, recently, uh, last year I believe, they had some numbers um, that looked at the future of the global Muslim population. Um, and they kind of have really neat uh, infographic that's on their website um, where you can actually see the figures for 2010 and then they do projected figures. Um, this is interesting uh, for a couple of reasons is that um, some people have said, oh wow, you know, uh, Muslims are rapidly uh, reproducing. And, uh, and soon, you know, they're going to they're going to be majority. Um, in, in France, where they have the highest rate actually of uh, of Muslims, um, what's projected to be happening um, in in France by the year 2030 is that the number of Muslims will actually expand to sorry, hold on, yeah, it's going to be at a rate. They're going to comprise 10.3 percent of the country's population, and that's so that's going to be by 2030. So. By no means majority, but a significant community nonetheless. Um, and currently, uh, oh, and then in Germany, where it's sort of on the lower end, um, Muslims will contribute, it will be 7.1% of the population by 2030. So the, the numbers are growing, but by no means as rapidly um, as people sometimes tend to exaggerate. And there's actually really excellent books that I do recommend um, you to see if you haven't. Um, called The Myth of the Muslim Tide. And it's written by um, a Canadian journalist named Doug Saunders. And what he does, he dispels many of the myths that have sort of gone along with the discourse around um, Muslim minorities. Um, and he talks about that, that myth that, you know, that the numbers are growing and that this is a threat to uh, Western civilization and whatnot. And he really goes into an, an, an analysis of why that's not true and, and how this sort of stereotyping has happened with other uh, minority groups historically. So it's definitely a book that I, I recommend for people to check out if they can. Um, so that's what we're looking at. So while Muslims make up relatively small percentages in Western societies, they join many other minority groups in negotiating their rights with the majority. Um, Canada, as many people know, adopted the term multiculturalism in 1971, and that was meant to embrace the differences that people brought with them, and it was meant to remove barriers and integration. And I'm going to skip then to um, talking quickly about intolerance, um, because intolerance, I think, um, kind of explains why it's necessary to have policies of multiculturalism. And again, I'm looking at the Pew Research Center's Forum on Religion and Public Life. They just released, um, again, statistics uh, looking at intolerance in terms of government restrictions, um, and may, many of you may have already seen, that, seen this, and social, uh, social restrictions as well, social um, hostilities. And the reason I'm going to just segue into this briefly is because I think it, it highlights to us um, that the, there's tensions, there's growing tensions with faith communities. And this, by no means, is limited to um, Muslim communities, as we heard yesterday in the sessions. This has to do with a lot of various groups. So what um, the Pew Research Center did, they looked at government restrictions, and that measures government laws, policies, and actions that restrict religious beliefs and practices. So they had 20 measures of restrictions, um, included efforts by governments to ban particular uh, faiths, prohibit conversions, limit preaching, or give preferential treatment to one or more religious group. So if you look, um, you know, Europe, uh, America, Sub-Saharan Africa, I mean, they're a little bit lower. They're a bit lower if you look here, so they're not as 
for example, Middle East, North Africa, it's much higher. But what, what I find to be a little you know, concerning is that um, the pink bar below is last year, um, and the median for their index was 5.2. For example, their Europe, it was 1.8. But the red bar is uh, as of 2010. So if we see, that means it's growing. So government restrictions on religion, the, the index, um, the rate at which it's happening is for all of these countries, all of these regions, sorry, um, there's uh, an increase in, in those restrictions. So I think that that's something that we sort of have to keep in the back of our minds as we talk about multiculturalism. You know, what is the need for it? What, what are we dealing with here? Well, there's clearly issues and there's clearly tensions. So that's sort of the backdrop that we have to think about. Um, I apologize, I think this slide is not as clear, but what I will point to um, high rates of social hostilities in Europe, there are certain areas in Europe that where there are high rates of social hus hostilities as indicated by the research center. And what that means is that um, private individuals, organizations, and social groups um, are getting involved in mob or sectarian violence, harassment over attire for religious re reasons, and other religion-related intimidation or abuse. So um, what we're seeing is that there are high levels of social hostilities, hostilities in Europe, and also moderately in Canada. So I mean, it's still an issue for us in Canada, um, and something that we have to be aware of and do our best to you know, bring those numbers down, um, because they are th a threat to social cohesion. Okay, so now to the, uh, to the crux of the discussion, having set that up. Um, the term multiculturalism, as uh, Tankett alluded to, has taken on somewhat of a negative connotation in recent years. Here in Europe, it's a, con it's a concept that has been denounced in certain countries, even by high-level leaders. And unfortunately, fears about multiculturalism has also led to the unre unreasonable and indeed dangerous conclusions. Again, uh, as we talked about Mr. Anders Breivik, uh, the Norwegian mass killer, um, he cited it as one of his motivating reasons for his devastating and deluded rampage. He blamed multiculturalism for potentially wiping out European culture. So, pretty strong claims. Um, but when official multiculturalism policy came into effect over 40 years ago in Canada, it was a positive affirmation and commitment to respecting Canadian diversity and ensuring participation in the country's social, political, and economic success. So this is in the preamble um, of our uh, law, or of the legislation that's on the books in Canada. Um, and I put it up there. It's the government of Canada recognizes the diversity of Canadians as regards to race, national or ethnic origin, color and religion as a fundamental characteristic of Canadian society and is committed to a policy of multiculturalism designed to preserve and enhance the multicultural heritage of Canadians while working to achieve the equality of all Canadians in the economic, social, cultural and political life of Canada. So, so that's sort of the overall intent. <clears throat> More concretely, um, an author um, and statistician, uh, Michael Adams, um, he wrote a book called Unlikely Utopia um, that was published a few years ago. And in it, he identified um, goals. So this is going a bit further than the intent. What were really the goals of multiculturalism? And I think, again, this is relevant uh, when you're talking about um, European and uh, immigration to European countries and how um, multiculturalism might you know, a positive affirmation might uh, assist. So for us in Canada, the goals were helping all new Canadians grow and contribute, overcoming cultural barriers to participation, promoting creative encounters and interchange among all cultural groups to promote national unity, assist immigrants in acquiring at least one official language in order to contribute and become <coughs> full participants in society. So he identified these are the four goals in a presentation he did. Um, this is a, a table, I hope you can all see it, it's, um, it's an evolution, it sort of marks the evolution of multiculturalism in Canada, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting table, but I'm going to uh, step back and actually describe this table as a story of my life and, and, my, and my dad's experience in immigrating to Canada. My dad came uh, to Canada, or went to Canada in the 1970s, so it was right here, Unfortunately, the text is not coming up, but basically here, this is multiculturalism in the, uh, sorry, multiculturalism in the 1970s. So the focus at that point 
um, was celebrating differences. Now, it came out of the reality in Canada is that we have two uh, charter groups, the French and the English, and that they are uh, having to negotiate uh, their cultures and their differences, as well as the Aboriginal community, which is a strong community in, in, in Canada. And so those were, you know, uh, factors that came into play when the Multiculturalism Act was passed by Pierre Elliott Trudeau um, in the 70s. And so, but it, it sort of went on to then encompass these waves of immigrants that were coming. And, and my father, as I mentioned, went in the 1970s. And at that time, the mandate was to sort of recognize ethnicity, recognize culture, um, and help people sort of individually adjust to the new society. And it was meant to sort of try to combat any prejudices um, and create, you know, offer solutions of, you know, cultural, um, cultural sensitivity and create kind of a mosaic. So we often hear Canada was the mosaic and the United States was the melting pot. So my book came in the 70s at that point where it was just starting. For him, um, as an immigrant, his attitude was, you know, bow down your head, don't say much, don't talk with an accent, try to just blend in as much as possible. Um, don't make waves. So that was his attitude, and multiculturalism had just started, right? So he came at that point where it wasn't yet uh, widely accepted, it wasn't really integrated into the discourse. So that was sort of the attitude of many of uh, my father's uh, friends as well who immigrated, um, and he immigrated from Egypt at that time. Um, in the 1980s, we had um, an evolution where the, the discourse became more about managing diversity. So I'm moving, if, if you want to follow with me, um, from column to column. Uh, uh, so this is the 70s, this is the 80s, this is the 90s, and this is the 2000s, so if, you're, if you're following me. Um, so where in the 1980s, it was more about managing that diversity. It's trying to create a structure, encouraging race relations. The term accommodation started coming out. Um, they want to deal with systemic discrimination, um, promoting employment equity, and trying to create, the buzzword then was a level playing field. So you want to have a level playing field where no matter where you were coming from, you had equal access to uh, getting to school, getting to university, getting into the workforce, and essentially succeeding. In the 1990s, again, we're moving, and there's, so there is definitely a slow evolution of the thinking um, in, in multiculturalism, and it went to a point where it was called, you know, constructive engagement, and that's where immigrants now are not necessarily just focusing on their, you know, their cultural dress or their cultural background. No, it's more about you're a citizen now. You're, you're, you know, we're talking about citizenship. When you come to Canada, you're part of this country. How are you going to um, feel that belonging, and how are you going to work towards the betterment of the society? So it's no longer, you know, just hyphenated. Uh, people, you're Canadian, Egyptian, no, you're Canadian, right? And you're here and you're building. So so there was a move then to really get citizenship to be sort of the core focus of multiculturalism, focusing on inclusion and trying to get rid of um, pockets of exclusion that were happening. And then getting to the uh, 2000s where we are now, where um, there's a real focus on establishing a Canadian identity, integration, uh, focus on rights, responsibilities, um, trying to get over um, clashes of cultures, which are happening, of course, and have continued to happen, and um, sort of creating dialogue, mutual understanding, and something that they called harmony jazz. So if you can imagine, you know, lots of different instruments playing, but everyone is playing in unison, so that you actually have a beautiful melody rather than this awful racket, right? And, um, and so, again, getting back to the story of my father, it was in the 2000s that I had made a conscious decision to practice my faith openly and to wear the hijab. And for him, it was such a shocker. And it's, it's often said that, oh, it's the fathers that ask the young ladies to put on the hijab. But my experience and the experience of many of my friends was the opposite. He said to me, you'll never get a job. You're never going to have anyone take you seriously. You're never going to be able to participate in the society because you're putting up a barrier. That's how he saw it. But I was a child then of multiculturalism, and I had grown up uh, where the discourse was, in this kind of discourse, this is what I heard in the schools, in the public schools that I attended. This is this inclusiveness, is what I heard. So I turned to him and I said, I am positive that I am not going to find this to be a barrier. And I was absolutely correct. My friends at university were very welcoming. They embraced it. I went on to work for, as, I, as Tenka mentioned, at the CBC. I never had, you know, thankfully, any barriers put up 
in front of me because I wished to practice my faith. It was very much embraced, and it was very much seen as one more example of that harmony jazz of our country. So I think that's, I mean, this is a bit of a rosy picture. There are many um, negative issues that can come up, of course. But this is one manifestation of how it worked. Okay, so as time went on, I talked about um, the evolution uh, of multiculturalism and, and sort of the, the ideas. And by the way, that table came from a book called Media and Minorities, uh, Representing Diversity in a Multicultural Canada. Um, so I didn't uh, come up with those terms. Those were uh, based on uh, research that was done. So, so I sort of painted, a, as I said, a rosy picture, but sadly, and a huge, huge tragedy that um, fell on all of us, uh, of all faiths and of all nationalities was September 11th. And as Mr. Adams, who I referenced uh, earlier and who wrote the book, Unlikely Utopia, um, the attacks of September 11th shook that utopia quite violently. And it really caused, I think around the world, uh, in Western countries, um, kind of a double take um, and made people question uh, what was happening in their societies. Um, and so I think that at that point, there was a little bit of a shift in understanding what multiculturalism meant, what it could mean, and what it had meant. So I think that, that kind of pinpointed a moment in time where things kind of stopped, and there was a lot of rethinking things. So there was definitely a backlash um, against uh, Muslim communities as well as other um, immigrant, immigrant communities, and the whole idea of multiculturalism then became, okay, we're letting people in and they might not actually uh, have ideas or principles that are in tune with Western democracy, with um, you know, uh, policies and practices and values that Western democracies hold. So all of a sudden, um, as this cartoon kind of illustrates, uh, multiculturalism was seen as a way that perhaps people with viewpoints that were completely antithetical to Western democracy, and I must add, are completely antithetical to Islam, were being allowed to uh, be you know, entering the country or allowed to propagate ideology that was counter uh, Western democracy. So certainly, it was seen as uh, creating a, a feeling, an environment of anxiety, and there was a fear about the unknown. In 2007, uh, the Canadian government actually wanted to do a, a sort of a, a look, a closer look at what multiculturalism um, had meant. All of these things were happening. There was a lot of backlash. This is in the U.S. Um, uh, you know, backlash against, for example, members of the Sikh community took place. They were mistaken for Muslims in many instances, and unfortunately, these incidents are continuing. Um, until you know, until very recently. So it's not something that is in the past. It's still a, a climate that we're experiencing. Um, but what what I think is interesting from the government's research, the Canadian government's research on multiculturalism, is that what happened was um, people who came together to talk about what went wrong um, in multiculturalism was they identified that religious diversity had not been fully explored when ideas about multiculturalism had been evolving over all those decades. So um, the government sat down, they sat down with uh, you know, members of the media, they sat down with uh, people inside government, outside government, NGOs, multicultural, like different ethnic groups, and they asked them you know, what went wrong. And religious diversity was an area that perhaps had not been looked at closely enough. So these are some images. Um, this one actually is in Ottawa. This is just last summer. Uh, summer of uh, 2011 um, in a mosque uh, near Ottawa, for example. So again, there's still, unfortunately, a very negative environment uh, out there. So evolution, where does that leave us then? Do we want to have this harmony jazz or this? Okay, so as I said, it's evolving. Um, and it's evolving through many ways. And as I said, I'm going to talk about the different cases. <laughs> but what happened was, when religious diversity 
was missing from previous understandings of the term, it's through legal cases that religious diversity has sort of come to the forefront. And now our courts in Canada are currently grappling with issues that deal specifically with tensions between religious minorities and majorities. However, even that concept isn't very accurate because what is emerging as well is that the concept of multiculturalism has traditionally referred to sort of that, that relationship for minority to the majority and not so much as an a, as a overall picture of how the society should be working. So in that round, the roundtable research the government of Canada did in 2007, the participants said really what was missing is trying to get all of Canadian society to really be engaged in the understanding of what multiculturalism would mean for everyone. And then the, the notion of reasonable accommodation came up, and that entered the discourse even more fervently. And I'll talk a little bit about one of the cases that sparked that um, in Canada. Um, but briefly, reasonable accommodation, and it was actually mentioned in a side event uh, last night, um, it was a term used to describe how the particular needs or sensitivities of religious minorities, including Jewish, Muslim, Sikh communities, could be met. So in the province of Quebec, um, which is a French province in Canada that many of you may be aware of uh, or have been to, um, there's a historical discomfort there with the role of the church and the state. And so they went through a period called the Quiet Revolution. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of discomfort around um, minority requests. A few years ago, the premier of the province, he put together a panel, and he put together a panel that made up of a philosopher and a researcher, and they traveled around the province to try to come up with a way to make reasonable accommodation work. What happened was, they came up, you know, they met with lots of Quebecers, lots of Canadians to talk about what is reasonable accommodation, what does it mean? Um, you know, some people were interpreting it to mean as, oh, you know, we don't want um, honor killings to be permitted in Canada. Well, you know, that was sort of the, the climate of, of fear. Of course, no one had ever said they wanted to do honor killings. That's completely illegal and it's completely against Islam. But there was a lot of discussion in the media by political forces that kind of made people feel that there was a threat uh, by these different minority requests uh, that was going to change the character of the province. And so, there, so this is the steps why there was so much opposition, and that's why the Premier decided to send out kind of like a fact-finding mission, and they came up with a, a, a pretty decent uh, policy on how to make it work. Um, and it, it cost them $5 million, and now it's sitting on someone's shelf. So we're hoping that um, that policy will actually sort of come into play in Quebec uh, more so with, with, in terms of how the government and state institutions deal with minority issues. Okay, so again, we're talking about reasonable accommodation now. It's coming into play. And there are those who scare people, again, into believing that the strength of someone else's belief or cultural background is a threat to your own if it's allowed to flourish. And unfortunately, this has been attached most strongly to Muslim communities, as has been pointed out. This trend is also chronicled in various other places. And um, Sometimes people feel that by allowing minority communities to exercise their rights, that this is going to come at a cost of national identity. This hypothesis rings true if one looks at where hostility, hostility towards immigrants or minorities plays out. Often in society where there's a very strong sense of identity, and that identity has shifted to such a degree that it's almost unrecognizable to its original state, the change then is blamed on the immigrants who are stereotyped as being unwilling to conform to their own new realities and demanding of the state to adapt to their own dictates. But as it has been pointed out in research, for example, in Canada, that Canadian Muslims are in fact very proud of their country and that they feel very much included and very much part of um, the overall Canadian fabric. Also, multiculturalism is assumed to have failed when one witnesses the so-called homegrown terrorist plots and crimes that are committed within these kinds of uh, climates. Um, other possible causes are rarely addressed, and people have said that um, often there are many other issues at play, and multiculturalism is often what's blamed, and this is inaccurate. So that kind of thinking was, again, chronicled by the government in its 2007 report. Sometimes um, it's politically expedient, feeding into stereotypes and negative sus suspicions that are often founded solely on media coverage, which we all know often focuses on the negative. You know, no news, uh, won't, you know, the bad news uh, is what makes the news, and if it's good, it's not going to be there. So this conflict, real or perceived, 
creates a kind of tension that leads people to the suspicious, suspicions of multiculturalism or any move on that front. So here's where we're going to sort of try to understand what's been happening in the court system in the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, what, what happened also in terms of multiculturalism is that the law itself used to fall under the responsibility of the, Canadian, the Ministry of Canadian Heritage in Canada. It was recently shifted to the Department of Citizenship and Immigration. So some people, um, some experts have questioned, has now multiculturalism moved away from being a part of the country's heritage to being something that must be managed like immigration? rather than something organic to Canada. So this is a question that we have yet to sort of see. Um, because there's two different ways that we could look at multiculturalism. It could be about relationships between people of diverse backgrounds, or it could be about rules only, how to govern these relationships. So, so it's, it's a very, it can be a very, very deep topic. I'm going to describe three significant Supreme Court cases now and, um, and, and say, show how they reflect multiculturalism, some of their ideals, and how they've been um, moving forward. So there's three cases um, that I'm going to just pinpoint quickly to. The first one was in 2004 um, called Amsalem. And interestingly enough, these three cases ha are, are dealing with other faith groups, not Muslim groups. So again, this is to show that the, the tensions and the conflicts happened with many different faith groups um, in, in society. So the claimant um, in Am Salam in 2004 was an Orthodox Jew. He lived in a condominium building in Montreal. And under the terms of the bylaws, um, there was no alter alterations or constructions or any kind of decorations that were permitted on the balconies of, of, of the building. But during uh, their holy festival of Sukkot, he wanted to build a sukkah on his bu building. So. Something like, something like this. So it's a structure, and it resembles a tent. Now, it was prohibited by the, by the bylaws of, of this building. And there was some evidence that you know, a communal sukkah could fulfill his religious requirements. But the claimant's interpretation was that he should build his own sukkah on his own balcony. So the question is, um, the company which owned the building, uh, do, do their property rights supersede the, the rights of freedom of religion, right? So there you have an example where there's two conflicting rights. Whose rights went out or went over? So that's a question I won't, I won't tell you the answer right now that, that the Supreme Court came up with. The second case has to do with a 12-year-old Sikh boy uh, named Gurbaj Singh. And he wanted to bring his metal kirpan, so his metal kirpan to school um, as part of his religious right. The school board requested certain limits, but another school board decided, actually, no, the Kirpan is a weapon. So, again, balancing safety concerns, rights of safety, and religious right. So think then of how you think the court should have ruled on that. And the third case that I want to mention involves a group of uh, Hutterites, uh, 250 Hutterites. And um, they believe that having their pictures taken uh, contravenes their religious beliefs. The beliefs uh, brought them head to head with an Alberta provincial statute, which of course requires individuals' photographs to appear on their driver's licenses. They didn't want to uh, comply with that. Uh, they, had a, they had had before a long-standing exemption from the law, um, and, but, they, but they live a lifestyle that they actually do need the driver's licenses to do their business, to travel around. So again, they, they, you know, the, uh, the Alberta decided no, they had to take the photographs and then it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. For the Supreme Court, again, to see these competing rights where you have the right of you know, the safety of society, you have to have identification versus, again, their religious rights. So these are competing rights. Does anybody want to like weigh in to see what how you think that the courts, if, I don't know if you know, but does anybody want to weigh in or offer any opinions on what you think? Any, anyone have any ideas? Does anybody know these cases? No, okay. Well, I'll tell you the truth what happened, don't worry. <laughs> um, so what, basically what happened, um, I'll, I'll explain to you, in each, in, in, in Salam, uh, the decision was made that the, own, the, owner, um, the owner's property rights could not limit the right of uh, the, the individual to put 
put up a sukkah. So he was allowed to put up a sukkah based on his religious rights. And I'll read what the court said in its, um, in its ruling. It said, respect for minority rights must also coexist alongside societal values that are central to the makeup and functioning of a free and democratic society. So it's obviously a much, much longer decision, but I'll just, I just want to read that because minority rights at that point were, were held up as something that had also to be preserved in a democratic society. So by limiting those minority rights, that could be uh, seen as affecting the overall democratic, um, the freedom and democratic uh, nature of society. Again, in Multani, um, the decision was, again, to allow him to have the kirpan, however, with strict limits. So he had to wear it concealed, um, you know, he couldn't access it easily or anything. Um, in, in order to sort of balance the safety issues, but again, a total prohibition, as the court said, against wearing a kirpan to school undermines the value of this religious symbol and sends students a message that some religious practices do not merit the same protection as others. So I'm reading from the decision. Um, on the other hand, Gurbaj Singh and allowing him to wear his kirpan under certain conditions demonstrates the importance that our society attaches to protecting freedom of religion and to showing respect for, for its minorities. The deleterious effects of a total prohibition thus outweighs its salutary effects. So again, the court is saying minority rights are critical and we have to protect them as well, balancing the other right of safety. So trying to find a solution that, yes, will protect the rights of safety of other students, nevertheless will not completely negate the religious right that this uh, student had. However, in the case of the Hutterites, um, the court shifted, and that's the most recent case, that was 2009. The court shifted slightly, and um, uh, one one woman that I, that I uh, heard from, Lori Beeman, she's the chair of uh, religious studies in Canada, in, in Ottawa, she, she was saying that this might mark now a beginning of a shift in the focus of the Supreme Court and, and how it's going to start interpreting these sorts of cases. So we're waiting to see if that's true. But in this case, what happened was, um, the court actually <coughs> said no. The, the Hutterites would have to take their photographs and that they said, um, this perspective must be considered in the context of a multicultural, multi-religious society where the duty of state authorities to legislate for the general good inevitably produces conflicts with individual beliefs. So we're seeing then more of the discussion of the general good of society. Um, so there, it's leading less towards the minority rights that they have the right to exempt themselves and perhaps uh, show their identification through other means versus an overall right. So some are saying, hmm, this could mean a shift in the case law. Um, and so what's interesting is that right now, uh, another case that's about to be released by the Supreme Court of Canada any day now that we're also waiting for, might further cement in our minds whether or not there is a shift going on in, in the way multiculturalism is uh, interpreted by the Supreme Court. Um, it's called the NS case. And this is another real interesting one. This, that's why there was some does deal with um, Muslim belief the case is, um, uh, NS is a complainant, I uh, can't say her name because uh, she's protected um, by a media publication ban. Um, she, she's an alleged child victim and she wanted to uh, go to court and uh, explain that her uncle and uh, cousin um, had uh, sexually assaulted her. She wears the niqab and when she went to the preliminary inquiry, uh, she did not want to remove the niqab for the uh, cross-examination. So the judge questioned her informally about her reason for wearing the niqab and heard arguments from the defense and counsel. He decided that the witness's niqab was a religious practice subject to exceptions and ordered her to remove it for her testimony. However, she challenged this decision and now it's at the Supreme uh, Court. It went to the Court of Appeal and then it went to the Supreme Court. So what's at stake again is two competing rights. There is the right um, for the accused to have a fair trial, um, section, um, there's two sections here, charter, these are charter rights. So he has the right for a fair trial and uh, his uh, lawyer is arguing they cannot have a fair trial if through cross-examination they cannot actually see the facial uh, reactions of uh, the witness um, and so that this is going to limit that freedom versus her uh, claim as a religious right that this is how she is. She's proven that this is something that she had practiced for a long period of time. 
it's a, it's a, strong, it's a sincerely held belief, and that by asking her to remove it, it's further uh, victimizing her when she's already um, claiming to be a victim of sexual assault. So again, you see there that there's two competing charter rights at play. So I reference this to a few people. Um, the Ontario Human Rights Commission has just come out with a policy on competing human rights. Um, just came out last spring. And what it's trying to do is deal with these sorts of issues. Um, and they're trying to get to a point where um, different rights are seen not as one superseding the other, but understanding that they all have legitimacy and that the goal must be to sort of um, make sure that no one right completely supersedes another. So the way it was described um, by Prabhu Rajan, he's at the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario, he said that the policy aims at understanding the context of rights claims, that no rights are absolute, and they are inherently limited by rights of others. There is no hierarchy of constitutional versus human rights. All are equally deserving. The aim is to achieve reconciliation that fully respects importance of both legal rights. So it's it's a full uh, framework that they've established, and um, you know it's it's one way. I think it's something that we have been following closely, and we see that it, it could be a potentially way to try to manage. Because now we're not again talking just about you know living all cohesively. We're dealing now in the court system where the rights are coming in direct conflict with each other, and how there must be the state has to sort of develop solutions for that. I just wanted to mention, for example, in the case of Germany, and I, I mentioned previously, um, there had been that situation where four Germans had filed criminal complaints against a rabbi for ritual circumcision. So the balancing of rights has been happening where the German government said, okay. Um, we are going to allow the circumcisions to take place as a religious right, but we're going to balance the rights of the child so that they've asked, you know, that the minimum amount of pain uh, must be, you know, there must be a minimum amount of pain. They're trying, again, so I'm showing this as an example that these sorts of discussions we're having in Canada are extremely relevant here as well. So, again, the charter right versus tar charter right. Okay, conclusion, I really appreciate you. You've been very patient with me. Um, so... Currently, it seems that multiculturalism itself is a term that means different things to different peoples, and as such will lead to social divis divisions, false associations, and a lack of relevance to youth. This is some of the concerns that people have had. Um, some people feel that multiculturalism, if it doesn't go beyond just talking about visible minorities and non-European immigrants, but it has to go to the whole public at large. So if it doesn't sort of envelope, um, you know, everyone's making it everyone's concern, then it's going to fail. Um, the lesson is useful for all states because you've got to get buy-in from the general public um, to guarantee the, the success of this policy. If the general public is not on board with you, that they want to have, you know, that they, you've ex you know, that the explanation of why it could be a good thing to promote, you know, the integration, to promote that you've got every person living in your community um, fully contributing, fully um, making the country better. Um, if you don't get a buy-in, it's going to uh, possibly fail. Um, so it's a lot about intercultural relations. And uh, I'll just conclude with um, a statement that was made by um, the Chief Justice of Canada, Beverly McLaughlin. Uh, she made this, this statement um, in 2008. Whether we like it or not, religious, ethnic, and cultural diversity is part of our modern world, and increasingly part of our national and community reality. Human rights and the respect for every individual upon which they rest offer the best hope for reconciling the conflicts this diversity is bound to generate. If we are to live together in peace and harmony within our nations and as nations in the wider world, we must find ways to accommodate each other. Human rights expressed in the fabric of our law and administered by our courts and tribunals provide a way to accomplish this. So I'll just end with those words and um, open it up for questions, comments. And again, thank you so much for being so patient. I know it's been a lot of you talking and I apologize for that, but uh, thank you so much. So I'll get a few questions, uh, and, then, uh, and then I'll try to respond as best as possible.
Thank you, Mira, for <clears throat> a very enlightened uh, description of the situation in Canada. I have two small comments, which are not a criticism of, um, of yours, or the general tendency in U.S. and America to use terminology. Uh, it is true that multiculturalism is dead in, in Europe, and I subscribe to that idea. And don't be shocked, because my reason for subscribing are not the same as Sarkozy's and, um, and others, you know. My reasons are, multiculturalism has never existed in Europe. What we had was monoculturalism with Bob Marley, belly dancing, and shish kebab. That is all we had here. The decision-making process, the money, the resources, and, and everything is in the majority hands. So they give us these handouts. You, know, you can dance and sing, that's it, but you cannot be part of the decision-making process. So in that way, multiculturalism has never existed. What my organization and my personally, I believe that we should move from multiculturalism to interculturalism, which is much more descriptive, is much more inclusive, and where all minorities and majority have the same decision-making process, so that nobody can dictate what is culture and what is not culture. So that is one thing. And then, <coughs> Uh, then you said you use the term Muslims all the time, and they are, I know many of our brother and sister use it. I think it's a big mistake. But when you use the word Muslim, then you're putting 1.7 people in one bag, saying that is our description. I always use the word Muslim communities because they're so diverse in every which way, the culture, what they eat, their history, their language, uh, what they think, they are not one. And Jewish people made a big mistake, in my opinion, when they start mixing ethnicity and religion, saying we are an ethnic group, but we are also at the same time a religious group. And unfortunately, it resulted in a very, very horrible things in, in Germany, where they use actually this argument against Jewish people. And I think we should go away from that ar ar argument. We are not a religious minority. We are actually very different ethnic minorities who share one religion. It's exactly like all your most Europeans are Christian, but they don't call themselves Christian. You know, they are German, they are Polish, they are Danes. And this, I think, is a much better way of describing people. So I hope uh, you know that um, this change will come. And it will be also acceptable to the majority society. I'm not the one who lies down and let the majority walk over me, never. But there are certain conditions living in a society that creates better bridges than saying, I'm a Muslim and you're a German, and I'm a Muslim and you're a Dane. This is very terrible comparison. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh can you hear me without the microphone? Yeah. Use the microphone. Okay. I'll use the microphone. First, as a continuation to the gentleman speaking before me, I was wondering about the name of your organizations, American Islamic Relations, because I had thought that there are Christian Americans and there are Sikh Americans and there are Muslim Americans and whatever Americans, non religious Americans and so on. But um, <clears throat> another impression I got from this and other discussion is that um, and these um, religious rights or, or rights based on religion seem to be kind of an overriding category. Maybe I'm wrong, but I get the impression that, for example, if my employer requires everyone to wear a tie to workplace, and if my religion forbids it, <coughs> then perhaps I may be allowed to work without a tie. But if I just happen to dislike ties, I still must wear a tie. So, kind of a religious reason is, is more important than other, other reasons to, to comply certain rules and, and rulings. And um, <clears throat> is this so? Do you think that uh, religious reasons or, or beliefs should be more tolerated than, than other reasons for doing whatever? <clears throat> okay, so um, I'll, I'll address those as best as I can. Um, in terms of 
multiculturalism never having existed uh, in Europe. I, I have. Well, you said it's dead, but it wasn't actually here, so how can. I don't know. Like, I'm not sure. Um, so it, it's dead or it's not here or whatnot. It, it, it didn't exist because it was monoculturalism with a dash of belly dancing, shish kebab, and, and bar marley. That is what it is, multiculturalism, in many Europeans' eyes. And that is not, it should be, it should be the culture. Okay, um, again, I can't really speak to the European experience because you're here, I'm not. Um, but again, I would point you to that book that I mentioned, uh, The Myth of the Muslim Tide. Um, because Doug Saunders, he's a, uh, The Myth of the Muslim Tide. Um, just came out maybe a couple months ago, maybe last month. Um, Doug Saunders is a Canadian journalist who was based in Europe uh, for quite a long period of time, based in London. Um, and so he actually looked at um, immigrant communities uh, and try to sort of look at the historical the, their historical development and he draws many parallels between Muslim community uh, Muslim communities right and um, and other faith uh, communities so it's a book that kind of you know that would probably give you a much much more better understanding then of, of how the whole issue of multiculturalism and interculturalism and whatnot um, but I but I mean the idea of interculturalism I mean again I think that um, when I talked about the intent the intent I think um, really is to try to create cohesive societies I mean you know there are going to be people from with all sorts of backgrounds um, in our societies, and so trying to make things work, just like in any organization, is really the bottom line. So whatever works for different, and again, Europe is not a monolith too, right? So Europe, there's many countries there, and they all have their own um, experiences. And so within each, see, the, the key thing here is that each country's population needs to figure out what they want and how they want to achieve it. So you have, as, as mentioned, you have to have buy-in. You know, it's not something to be imposed. It's not something that the state or any group or whatnot can sort of put out there. It has to be something, there has to be some kind of dialogue, um, you know, happening, and it, and it hopefully has to be done in kind of a, 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 an intent to make things positive, right? To try to get rid of stereotypes and the negativity that unfortunately attaches itself to these sorts of discussions. So it's something to, to discuss. Did you want to say anything? Okay. Um, and yes, Muslim communities are extremely diverse, and when I talk about Muslims, I, it's just, it's, it's true. I mean, we're not only, should not only define an individual based on their faith, and I think it's difficult because I'm talking about, um, you know, individuals who have, you know, who might say that they're Muslim, whereas, of course, the levels of practice are different, the, you know, they themselves may not consider themselves, you know, when they walk around, oh, I'm a Muslim, right? Like, they might just think I'm whatever, you know, I'm a heavy metal fan, like, it's, it's, it's true, it's kind of, I definitely don't want to be labeling people, um, particularly they don't want labels, I don't think of myself, you know, I'm a Muslim, I just, I'm a Canadian, right, who say, where are you from? I'm from Canada, that's where I grew up, that's my identity, um, and all this is just, that's just, you know, it's just like wearing uh, a heavy metal t-shirt or whatever, it's just part of who I, who I am to me, so definitely I don't want to be stereotyping or, or kind of pigeonholing uh, people who are very diverse, nevertheless for this discussion though, I think it was important to, to say, you know, this is the experience of, you know, Muslim communities or other faith communities. Um, in terms of the points that you raised uh, about um, our name, uh, so it's the Canadian Council on American Islamic Relations. It's a mouthful, and um, we we do serve Canadian Muslims only. We are not um, a multi-faith group. Uh, we uh, we work with lots of different faith organizations. Um, so we definitely try to promote interfaith dialogue and whatnot. But we are we are uh, in existence to serve Canadian Muslims and to sort of help uh, promote their rights. And we put out position papers. Um, you know, and try to give uh, you know some kind of voice. Um, the, but there are many other organizations that uh, try to do the same, just like in any any NGO NGO environment. Um, and in terms of religion being an overriding category, like if you don't want to wear a tie and your boss tells you uh, to wear a tie, I really you know I, I I don't know what to say to that. I mean, it's it's a very interesting discussion. I mean, for me to go to work and uh, you know say I want to wear a hijab, but they say, sorry, you cannot work here and wear that. Um, 
you know, for me, I, you know, our charter guarantees uh, religious rights. I mean, it guarantees that every Canadian has the right to uh, be free, for example, of discrimination based on, uh, you know, their religious identity, their uh, sexual orientation, their gender, whatnot. So there are certain rights that are within our charter. And among the various rights that are guaranteed by it, um, religious uh, freedom and expression are, are just part of that. So. Wearing a tie or not is not in the charter last time I checked. I mean, maybe it's something to talk to an MP about, but it's, it's a bit different. I mean, we're talking about sort of fundamental um, beliefs, and yeah, you know, and so it's something we can think about. Um, just to introduce something yeah. to what you just uh, said, uh, I think it should be more related with your identity. Uh, if uh, if uh, your uh, religion. Uh, uh, requires you to, to to do certain things, uh, uh, and and because religion is uh, uh, part of your identity, then of course uh, uh, the, the society should respect uh, uh, your desire to, to to maintain your identity. But of course, there are some competing rights, and this should be is. Uh, 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 Amira suggested it should be negotiated, uh, uh, and the best solution uh, must be found. But I don't think that it is like wearing a scarf uh, is always the same with uh, only a prefer individual p preferences. Because uh, uh, that, uh, and, of, and if you have a, a belief uh, and you you think that you you belong to a community, uh, you have an identity, convictions that you shouldn't wear. Uh, Thai, I think it's again uh, the same ground, but there is a difference uh, uh, because this is just based on individual preferences. The other is more related with identity. This is how I could see the difference. Uh, I mean, it's so maybe like, there are more comments and such yeah. uh, uh, questions. So let's uh, have a little bit more. Uh, I just wanted to because yesterday. <laughs> Not one. So yesterday we had a talk, it was said that uh, much of what is considered Muslim uh, habits are actually not a part of the religion, but part of the culture. And uh, there must of course be a discussion about what is a part of, uh, what are cultural rights, what are rights, and what are religious rights, and what is religion or spirituality in the habits that are coming and connected to uh, different religious groups. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Maybe to um, go ahead with this uh, question. Um, I think uh, there's a mixing of two debates, actually. You're always talking about major culturalism. And on the other hand, you're talking about um, Islam or Muslims. and. Um, you, you yourself said your identity is Canadian, but on the other hand, your organization is called Council for American Islamic Relations, meaning you make a split between these two things. Meaning, on the other hand, you compare two totally different things because being American could be being Muslim, could be being Christian, could be whatever, being whatever. But if you compare it with Islam, you make Islam an cultural complex like being American. And then if you go back to this multiculturalism idea, as we understood it as Europeans, it means that different cultures can live hopefully peacefully together in one region, let's say like this, one state, whatever. But it also means that they accept each other and probably don't mix the cultures itself. So. To get back to the point, American Islamic um, relations, it would mean it would never mix. This is strange for me. Thank you very much. Just to just to follow up on uh, the question that was that was previously uh, that was previously posted, uh, I would like to to know uh, your because maybe I didn't uh, pay enough attention, but I'd like to have your reply on the on the example with the with the ties and the company. Would you would you uh, like to comment on this? Thank you very much. 
Then perhaps. Um, so in terms of the first uh, question that was asking, you know, that there, it's true that there are certain habits, for example, that may be considered to be more close, closely tied to the cultural background of an individual um, or their heritage that sometimes people will say this is actually not coming from Islamic doctrine. Um, but what the courts in Canada have said is that they are not in the business of actually trying to ascertain what is religion and what is culture. It's enough so far um, in the courts to, to have the sincerely held belief that something belongs to your religion. So, uh, for example, in the case that's before the Supreme Court right now that we're waiting for, um, in the appeal court, um, they wanted to set up a kind of a framework for trying to understand, you know, why does this woman wear the niqab? You know, is it something that she's been wearing for a long time? Is she really sincerely believing this? And they set up a test. Um, however, that's what's being challenged as well, is that um, the court, uh, the arguments have been that the court should not and would not want to sort of get into the doctrinal uh, rulings, because then the courts will sort of have to take on um, decision-making uh, powers in terms of, okay, this is, you know, this is uh, Orthodox Judaism, or this is Orthodox Islam, and, this, and so, I mean, that, that would pull it into, um, you know, a lot of issues. Um, the courts, so the courts so far has basically said, if the person claiming the accommodation can show that what they are asking for is a sincerely held belief that is then protected by uh, charter rights, and that sort of ties in then to the question about the ties, you have to show that the right that you're trying to get an accommodation for falls under the charter of Canadian rights and freedoms that we have. So you would have to attach it to one of those protected uh, rights. So for example, again, the freedom of religion or the freedom you know, to be free of discrimination based on gender, uh, sexual orientation, um, you know, uh, ethnicity, all of those different things. So it has to tie back into the charter. Um, so that's where it's at right now. Uh, but again, as I said, this case is coming out soon, so it may it may uh, offer a little bit more guidance of where the court wants to go in maneuvering this discussion. Um, in terms of the point about um, sort of setting up, you know, uh, a different category of you know Islamic as a as a uh, as an entity versus the culture, I I'm, I'm in agreement with you. They should actually just be all one. However, when we're talking about um, the the rights, um, we have to explain it within that framework of, okay, I'm talking about the rights as a Muslim. So, uh, I, you know, a, a, someone from the Jewish faith or someone from a Sikh faith will talk, when they're talking about religious freedoms and rights, they're going to be talking about it from that framework, from the framework that, you know, the faith framework that they've chosen to live by. So that's where um, it's an, uh, there is that negotiation happening. However, everything that, that we, for example, discuss in terms of our religious rights is under the umbrella of the Canadian Charter. So it is definitely within the framework that all Canadians subscribe to. Um, so definitely, I mean, I, I'm not responsible for the name, but I agree with you. I think it should be much more inclusive. And as I said, I do see myself as a Canadian, um, as you know, other people see themselves based on whatever they want. But I see myself as a Canadian, and I agree. It shouldn't be, uh, I don't see them being um, in dialectal opposition. However, I, as a, as, a, as a Muslim, that's one of the areas that I will um, describe if I'm dealing with my religious rights. However, as a woman, I can, you know, if I, if I was working for an NGO that dealt with women's issues, I will have, you know, the Canadian women for rights and freedoms. And it doesn't mean that being Canadian is in opposition to being a woman. It just means that in this framework, I'm talking about women's rights. So. That's that's sort of how I can describe it. It's just sort of that's the framework that that we're discussing uh, mm -hmm. this in. Um, but again, no, being Canadian, you can be a woman, you can be uh, a Muslim, you can be uh, anything. And, and as I said, Canada has generally had um, you know a, a, an inclusive policy that I talked about. Strange, I'm not getting what you're writing. May I re respond? Shortly? Yes, please, of course. Yes. For sure, there won't be an American women interrelations group because that would be impossible. Um, maybe you have a woman, women rights group. And the thing is that the state, the democratic state, is always in connection with the individual, not with the group. Never, ever. 
So everything you say, like the human rights, is not because you are Muslim, but because you are a man. Yes, you are a human being. So this this other word thing is just a way around. Right, and 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 these are good points, you know. And just like multiculturalism is evolving, I agree. I think our discussion has to evolve as well. And I think that um, uh, you know, for our organization, it's true. I don't. Uh, I personally, but this is my personal viewpoint. Again, I can't. I can't say you know on behalf of the organization. This is this is uh, you know the the opposition there between Islamic and Canadian. I think that the intent again behind that uh, was to say we're discussing the the. Uh, the various uh, perspectives of Muslims within the, the Canadian context or American context. However, as we evolve, you're right, and we would come into the fold and say, yeah, I mean, these are Canadian Muslim issues, but you're right, the relations, um, you know, I, I think it's a bit of semantics. I think that, again, the ten intent of it is to just sort of describe, um, you know, our role in terms of trying to empower Muslims and that, and that kind of thing. So thank you. Yes. Uh, again, you use uh, sometimes this word religious rights or Muslim rights. Uh, I can give you an example in France when they were, uh, many years back, when they were discussing to ban headscarves. Many Muslim, many organizations, uh, religious organizations with Muslim background, they came up with this idea that wearing a scarf is our religious right. And I met some of the imam and I said that in a secular society, this argument will never fly. Because France can say, okay, this is a secular society, we cannot accept that argument. But if you use the argument that wearing a scarf or wearing a beret is my human right, then France will never be able to say, no, you cannot practice your human right. But the, the, commu the communities, especially the imams, you know, they actually wanted to make it a religious problem. And that is why they lost. And I think that the Muslim community should be clever. They should be much more forward looking and not use this religious right or Muslim right argument, but use as a human right argument. And there is no society in the world who will ever tell you, no, you cannot exercise your religious right. I mean, you can. You have a right to go with headscarf. I have a right to go with beret or somebody has a right to go with, with bikini. So I think many, Muslim organizations who work with Muslim causes, they make big mistake that they identify themselves and everything they want to demand as a Muslim. And if I was the president of uh, a secular country, I said, then go to Saudi Arabia or go to Pakistan and, and practice your religion there. And that would be a very valid argument. Thank you. Yes, Sarah. Thank you. And just, I want to reflect on uh, the claim that there are no groups' rights, but in fact, uh, if you look at the human rights literature, uh, like there are different uh, classifications, and one of the classifications that you would see that in human rights are well, it's individual rights, groups' rights, and collective rights. And you would see in some human rights documents saying that uh, individuals, like persons, are entitled to practice this a special religion in, in community with others. So in this respect, there are rights uh, guaranteed to certain groups, but uh, and uh, these rights, uh, again, not uh, not by collective rights, because collective right is uh, like right to self-determination, which can be used by only a collective group. But group rights uh, uh, cannot be claimed by groups, also by, by individuals. On the other hand, the practice of those rights uh, uh, acknowledged that uh, is done by uh, with the group. Uh, so this is allowed. And when like you look at the, uh, the International Covenant on Civil and, uh, on Civil and Political Rights, this is what uh, written. So I don't think that mm -hmm. group rights can be rejected that easily. You talk about group rights, I am a human member. But then you are making, again, that's, that is the mistake we are making. We are making Islam into a group. It's not, I mean, if people live in Germany and they want to do something, they, they have to abide by the laws of the land. And you cannot say, well, I belong to a group because Islam in my eyes is not a group. Yes, group can be many things. Then you have to be, you have to be very specific which group you are talking about. <laughs> Okay, 
uh, uh, it's up to you how you define it. It's, it should be defined individually. Uh, it, it's up to you how you decide which group you, you belong to. But there are some people certainly who would say they, uh, they, they belong to, to Islam or they belong to Shia Muslims or uh, Canadian Muslims. Uh, so it's, uh, and you maybe you belong to a secular Muslim uh, community in Denmark. I don't know. This is uh, an individual uh, decision. Right, and I think that what's happening, again, going to the Canadian perspective, is that it's true. I mean, it is on an individual basis that the discussion happens, right? So, again, we, the umbrella that we're dealing with in, in, in Canada is that we have the Charter, so the Canadian Charter. So that kind of defines um, sort of all the different rights that are afforded to Canadians. And it's within that Charter that, you know, anyone can come and make a claim for rights. Um, and within that framework, then the courts decide whether or not you know, their right has been uh, contravened or whether or not um, there needs to be an accommodation to ensure that that right is um, respected. So it's within a framework, and I don't think anyone has ever suggested going beyond or outside of that. I mean, that's, that's, that's our constitution, um, which you know, I think that uh, Canadians, you know, that's, that's, that's the framework that we're working with. So, it's within that, and again, it's true, it's an individual that will come and say that my right has been um, you know, harmed or I'm worried about this right, and that's how the negotiation happens. So you don't, you know, you'll have interveners and whatnot, but it is usually referring to a specific individual right. And I think uh, if we um, really stick on that topic, um, we could make a really clear um, differentiation between, between individuals and groups because if you don't say um, you belong to a group because maybe you were born as Muslim or whatever, but if you define people belonging to a group by their actions, so meaning being a Muslim, meaning practicing Islam, then you can tie this together. Yes? But if, if you would turn it around, say you're born as Muslim, so you are Muslim, or you're born as Jewish, and so on, yes, or American, or German, whatever, and then you would have this collective or group rights, which in fact is not so true, um, you would have big problems because then you could say, okay, every uh, immigrant doesn't have a right to whatever. Yes? And this is what you uh, said, Mr. I don't know your name, sorry. Um, there's a right to practice your religion or your belief alone or in groups, as is mentioned in the Human Rights Charter. It's also again individuals meeting in groups. So there is, because otherwise you would have this problem that the state defines what the group is. And that should never happen, of course, because the state has no right to define what I am, if I'm Muslim or not, for instance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have some thoughts I would like to sh um, share with you. Um, I think as well that we um, belong to a group or more than that to different groups. We have different identities as mother, as daughter, in this room as OCE participants. But the um, problem is within this debate uh, or the ge general debate concerning Muslims is that they took uh, or take the category Islam and make it to a... Or, the um, side of a per human being, its religious side, and um, do it as the only <coughs> stable, unchangeable factor of this person, and that's the problem. And Islam, you can change Islam, you can change sure. religion, you can um, change your um, belief, so and that's the problem, I think. Um, you belong to a group, as a woman, I belong to the group of women. Yes, you can change your sex as well, but it's a little bit um, um, more difficult than changing your religion. Um, <laughs> and I think that the debate on how we discuss about Muslims or Christians or other groups, religious groups, um, has an impact on how they um, define themselves. I see a lot of Muslims in a very defensive action attitude. If a Muslim, I see uh, the description, Muslim in Afghanistan makes anything, a Muslim here is asked why do the Muslims uh, do like that? And the Muslim, that's the problem, say, 
his lap is not bad, we Muslims are like this and that, and that's the problem as well. But is it, if a woman or a man does anything in Afghanistan or someone else, or a gay, not uh, the gays here, um, they, um, they weren't asked from the population, I think this way of discussing, this way of treating, that's the real problem. And um, I don't, I don't have any solution. But I only see with uh, big, um, with big sorrows and big uh, worries, this development. It is described in academic articles as a shift from being a foreigner to being a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And by this, you construct the Islamic community as well. Let the Muslims be alone. I will take a joke from my Jewish colleague. She said, if three rabbis are together, you have four, uh, four opinions. And I say, if um, three Islamic authorities are together, they have at least four opinions or five. But when you uh, construct this Islamic uh, community from the outside, you enforce a special identity which uh, doesn't exist. And that, uh, that's only a remark. Thank you. <laughs> she wishes. Yeah. I think this um, kind of lumping together starts with both extremes. I mean, far-right extremist Islamophobic people like to say all Muslims are like that. And some people say all Christians are like that. But then on the other hand, I believe that some responsibility is shared by, by religious leaders who claim that uh, Christians have right to do this and that, or, or Muslims have right to do this and that. They, they, <clears throat> play, they play the same game. And I think I see that game also in this um, <coughs> OSC community. <coughs> in the, I've been following this for some years now, and uh, <coughs> there's been more and more talks about, about religious rights and discrimination based on religion, and not, not so much on human rights. We talk about uh, freedom of religion instead of freedom, freedom of assembly, freedom of conscience, etc. And I think I'm not quite happy with that, that kind of development. That, that we, of course, when whoever has problems, human right problems, for whatever reason, we should talk about it here. But should we label those as, as discrimination based on religion or, or freedom of religion or talking more? general human right terms. That's an, another question. Thank you. Just, just a reflection in Mark, on what uh, was said uh, now. Uh, uh, if you look at the agenda of the HDM, you will see that uh, there is a session on freedom of assembly and uh, different uh, uh, human rights uh, categories are discussed. Uh, uh, so the reason that uh, we are discussing also discrimination based on religion is just to, to, uh, to address some of the issues in, in relation with that topic, but of course uh, also discrimination based on gender, discrimination uh, based on sexual orientation, all these uh, issues are important and should be discussed. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Vaisal Filiz, I'm from Kojab International and I'm coming from France. <laughs> yes, sorry for that. <laughs> because uh, when we try to analyze Anglo-Saxon countries and UK at first, in a lot of meetings, it's uh, not easy for us from the French perspective to invite some, someone from UK because their model is completely different and their understanding uh, com when you compare to, to the continental e Europe. When we are talking about Canada, it's like Disneyland for us, you know, for the villages. <laughs> you cannot, it, it, it's really a different type of uh, understanding and uh, many times since years and years I try to, to see what we can take from there as a, as a best practice, best examples. And it's uh, because the continent of Europe is at the origin <laughs> of Western world, it's difficult for them to take something from the USA or, <coughs> or from Canada. <laughs> That's why uh, we have only one community, and it's the, the national community in France. And uh, when you see that, you, you, you show us 
the population, Muslim population uh, in France, uh, normally they had no uh, uh, numbers of that or statistics for uh, cultural or ethnic groups or religious groups. And I, I'm wondering how you, you get that. Probably uh, uh, there is some other uh, techniques. And seventh thing, it was about uh, the hostile society uh, in and uh, I should saw that in Russia, the situation is very difficult. But when you talk with the Muslim communities in Russia, uh, it's strange because they have a complete different type of living together model, of intercultural model, and in some parts it's much better than Western Europe. That's why we have to be very, uh, we have to take care of the, 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 the living of the people and we have to, to get their, their direct feelings on that. I think the, the most important is not to think on on the, you know, since yesterday and our discussions in the main sessions and also uh, in, the, in the side event, I think the, there is a real problem and fear uh, uh, about Muslim communities. And it's not because people are ignorant about Islam or uh, in Canada. Mm -hmm. People are very, uh, or they want to to have such uh, position is because some people have an agenda on that, and it's mostly a posit uh, political agenda, and uh, it's uh, not a sim uh, simplistic uh, human reaction. It's a political project, and through that project they have some. Uh, probably uh, interest and we have to look on the situation uh, in that way because uh, about the place of Muslim communities in Western societies it, our, our future is dependent on that and I think uh, you know they are very well organized mm. there's a lot of intellectuals behind that and it's not only a problem of uh, misunderstanding of living together and all what we can say uh, in our meetings. It's really an agenda and we have to tackle this agenda all together with all communities and with all experiences. That's why uh, building coalitions are very important today. Is there any more comments before we kind of wrap things up? Okay, um, just to reflect quickly then on uh, the comments. Um, I think that um, when we articulate human rights, um, I think we can, I, I, I don't, I personally don't see um, the harm in, in identifying what kind of human right is, is being discussed. Um, so if we're talking about faith, um, you know, religious right, um, I, I'm, I think that it's a valid thing to identify what is the right that we're discussing. Um, and as uh, uh, Mr. Saikin mentioned, um, I think that the OSC is trying to look at all the various different kinds of rights. And also I find that there seems to be a negative connotation as well attached to the word religion. Um, there is a negative, and, and that's, that's very deep and historical. Um, and uh, I think that, um, you know, when we talk about it, I think, again, the, the, the whole policy of competing rights is trying to say no one right should, should be stronger or more valid than another right. They are, exactly as you said, all human rights, and I think human rights are all in and of themselves valuable, um, and I think that if we name them um, to be more specific, I think there's no harm in that, but I, I can understand your reticence just based on um, you know, historical, um, the historical connotation of the word religion. Particularly when it might seem that it, it's the aim is to again supersede someone else's rights. So because I want to practice my faith, there might seem to be a threat that that might impose my right on someone else's right. And I think the whole exercise of this discussion that we've been having is talking about how the rights are um, negotiated so that no one walks away um, a winner or a loser that you have people just trying to negotiate and trying to sort of come to the best case scenario, the best kind of solution to sort of find a compromise of those rights. So I think that that's 
the discussion that we're trying to have. Um, and then in terms, yeah, of the models, uh, the mentioning of the UK model is different than the French model. model. Um, and then the statistics uh, are from the Pew uh, Center on Religion. Um, so that's all, what I, what I uh, refer to are, are from their website, and it's all available on their website. And if there's anything that I've mentioned um, in the talk that anyone wants references for, please come see me. I can send you all the references. And again, I want to just thank you for the discussion. I hope that it's um, given some of, uh, perspective uh, from, from what's going on in Canada. Um, of course, there's very much more to say, but, uh, but we'll leave it at that. And again, thank you very much for participating and attending. Thank you. Scheiße, ich nehme sie. Ja, wirklich. Aber wenn wir ein Brett auf die Hände haben. Ja, ist gut. Ist ja gut.